Hello, welcome back, my Royal Rogues. My name is Jesus Enrique Rosas. I'm the Royal Rogue, and tonight we have the fat bill that Gingerbread will have to pay for his failed legal shenanigans. Prince Harry faces 500,000 pounds legal bill after high court defeat. Royal loses bid to be able to pay for his own police bodyguards, and taxpayers could also be left 300,000 out of pockets. I wonder how many spare copies can make up for such a colossal blunder. Do you think this will dissuade him in the future? According to figures obtained by Freedom of Information Request, or around 200,000 pounds of taxpayer money has gone towards the government's legal department costs in this case, plus 100,000 just for general counsel. The ruling comes amid a high court trial in which he is bringing a claim against Mirror Group newspapers over allegations of unlawful information gathering. Last week, he paid for a KC and three other barristers to argue in a court that his alternative offer to pay for such girls should be reconsidered. Uh, by the way, KC, I didn't know what a king's counsel was in British law, but the first thing that I thought when I read that is that Harry should have listened to the king's counsel and just stay overseas. And this is interesting to know. The police have pointed out that when they do take payment, such as for providing security at football matches, it is generally on private land and would not involve potentially leaving London. There are also strict rules surrounding firearms. Sir Martin said wealthy individuals paying for police guards was different in kind from the police services provided at, for example, sporting or entertainment events, because they involve the deployment of highly trained specialist, uh, specialist officers, of whom there are a limited number, and who are required to put themselves in harm's way. But Harry's barristers will have claimed that it is no big deal since the prince has put himself in Meghan's way, which is uh, much more dangerous. And speaking of the Duchess of Sausages, her brand new public relations agency is working overtime to fix the car chase fiasco. Meghan Markle's inner circle, Beyoncé, Oprah, Gwyneth Paltrow helped Duchess climb status ladder. By the way, what kind of a status ladder is Meghan trying to climb? Because we already know that her political ambitions, at least for now, have been thrown away. I don't know if she's still keen on that, but by this point, she's just trying to remain popular. And this piece is interesting because of the women she is looking to steal clout from. First, I don't understand how Oprah still allows Meghan to mention her in these pieces. And I find funny how they make this disclaimer halfway through the article. When it comes to Markle, it's hard to determine who's really in her circle or on her side. No shit, Sherlock. I would say that even Meghan's friends have trouble knowing if they are still in her circle because you don't know when the Duchess can just pull the rug from under a friendship when you are no longer needed. It would help a lot if Meghan released a private app for her current acquaintances where they could check in real time if they are still friends or they have been dumped. This would save these poor souls a ton of time and embarrassment. But let's continue. She's fallen out with her own family and has seemingly become persona non grata with the royal family, the PR expert added. Instead of paparazzi chases, star spotting and generally spreading herself too thin, Markle might be better served by narrowing her focus and doubling down on only two groups, her husband and home life, and her business management team at WME. Well, that her husband and home life sounds a bit dry, don't you think? That part of the article lacks something. But I just can't tell what it is. But anyway, Oprah was mentioned in that article, despite you would remember that the Montecito duo staged all that stuff of visiting her state, reaching the gate of her house, and then leaving while Oprah was not there. She was in Nashville visiting her father, who was on his last days. But you might imagine that she didn't like being used by the Harkles for cheap headlines. 
Oh, and in case you are wondering, no, they did not release any public statement about their friend's father. But the level of desperation is such that what they call her inner circle of friends is just rehashing all the events they have shared with her no matter how long ago. Yeah, so much for Oprah being in Meghan's inner circle when the only reference they can mention is the Oprah interview more than two years ago. The last time we saw something that could remotely pass as contact between them is when Gail King asked Oprah about what did she think of Harry and Meghan attending King Charles' coronation, and the words say it all. I think they should do what they feel is best for them and for their family. That's what I think. That's what the bottom line it comes down to. What do you feel like is the best thing for you? They haven't asked me my opinion. And that doesn't sound like inner circle material, don't you think? Or when they mention Beyonce, they go all the way back to that Lion King premiere. But again, no other events, no more public contact, no nothing. Well, I know that Beyonce and Jay-Z are quite private, and maybe she doesn't reveal her true connections with the Monte Shit Show couple. But now that we are talking about inner circles, it's funny that there are also articles about Beyonce's Oscar after party. And a lot of A-listers from show business were there, not only coming from the Academy Awards. It's strange that the Duke and Duchess of Sausages were not invited, right? Because if Chrissy Teigen was invited, well, it's just embarrassing. Well, let's talk about happier things. You'd agree with me that the cake you're looking at right now looks absolutely gorgeous. Not only on how impeccable it was made with all the decorations, but also the purple hue matches the flowers of the background. I would not blame you if you thought that this was an image generated artificially, but it's not. It's the real deal. It's the cake that was presented to King Charles and Queen Camilla for their Belfast visit. You can see for yourself that they were enjoying themselves. And I would not want to cut that cake either. It's just too awesome. Uh, they were visiting the new coronation garden in Northern Ireland. And these pictures are just lovely. An announcement from Buckingham Palace on 24 may reveal the king and queen have arrived in Belfast this afternoon, where their majesties will begin a series of engagements marking the first visit to Northern Ireland following the coronation. At Hasselbank Park in Newton Abbey, the king and queen will open the new coronation garden, which has been established to commemorate their majesty's coronation, as well as to mark the start of a new green initiative for the local community. Their Majesties will open the gates to the garden before meeting with those involved in the design, which, wa which has been created using and inspired by the same sustainable gardening principles used by the King and Queen. Their Majesties will meet school children who have been taking part in coronation themed projects, as well as members of the community who volunteer for local charities during the big help out over the coronation weekend. And recipients of the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, the King's Award for Enterprise, and the Duke of Edinburgh Bursary, the King and Queen will cut a cake before departing. I have already put this on my to-do list when I visit Northern Ireland. And I want to comment on this picture of the Duke of Kent that I stumble upon today. Thanks to Sir Walter Raleigh, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, sporting a bowler hat today while acting as Royal Colonel of the Rifles Regiment. The bowler hat was originally created by the London hat makers Thomas and William Bowler in 1849. This is proper English-British fashion. And I've always thought that the Duke of Kent must have the most amazing stories to tell. That's a memoir I would read because uh, that's the physiognomy and body language of someone discreet. That's what makes him even more interesting. And then I found out that he had already published his memoirs last year. I already ordered it on paperback, so I will be updating you on my thoughts. 
Then I went a little bit further with my imagination and that picture, and I saw myself at 80 plus years old, living in Japan, dressed like an Englishman, writing like an Argentinian, eating like an Italian, and enjoying life like a Venezuelan. Life goals. My Royal Rogues, remember to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you get notified on my upcoming episodes. The two most important words, much love and glory.